Thank you. I'm going to say more in a minute, but I'm going to drop us right in to the experience. Most of us take the ability to speak utterly for granted. To speak is to have a voice, to be understood by others through the use of our voice. From the time we are very young children, our primary means of communication is through speech. We talk with our friends. We whisper secrets. We shout and cheer at the top of our lungs and make our voices heard. We use our voice to share stories across space and to tell our stories across the generations. But what if you couldn't speak or use your hands? How would you communicate? How could you prove that you can learn, that you have an opinion, that you matter? As educators, we may assume our students' ability to talk, to express themselves through audible speech. When children come to our classrooms, we focus on literacy and numeracy. We may help them explore and inquire into the world of science and history. We, make it, we assume that we are drawing upon a foundation of speech. We may take a child's ability to speak utterly for granted. But consider the non-speaking child, a child who cannot hear, or sorry, who can hear words being spoken around them, but who due to an unruly body cannot coordinate the breath, sound, and movements necessary to produce intelligible speech of their own accord. A child who to give independent voice to their thoughts must do so through a speech generating device. First, I think what to say, then I input the words into my device. Once I have constructed my message, I push speak so that I can speak those words out loud. Milo Ponty, the famous French philosopher, tells us when we speak, we do not think about speaking. Rather, if we think at all, we must think of what we are saying. We must, in fact, stop picturing the code or even the message to ourselves and make ourselves sheer operators of the spoken word. While that rings true for those of us who can speak with our natural voices, it hardly seems the case for people who speak through a machine. Now I will say proper welcome and hello. <laughs> My talk today is coming to you from a very early morning in Canada. My name, as was already mentioned, is Kathy Howery, and I am very honored to be joining you all in this wonderful international conference focusing on AAC beyond the AAC system. What a wonderful topic. What I'm going to share with you today is a bit of my doctoral research. While my PhD is still relatively new, relatively, <laughs> my experience working with children and youth with complex communication needs goes back now over 40 years. I began working in 1982 <clears throat> at a school for students with multiple disabilities. Back then, I worked with marvelous technologies such as the Apple IIe computer, the adaptive firmware card, and the most high-tech, at least at the time, Zygo 16 and Zygo 100. If I could have imagined then the AAC devices that exist, that exist today, I am certain I would have thought all of my and my students' communication challenges would be solved. As we are gathered here for this important international conference focusing on AAC, I'm sure you will agree with me, we still have a long way to go. What I'm going to share with you today are pieces from my phenomenological study into what it's like to speak with, or is it through, a speech generating device. During my doctoral research, I spent five years reading accounts of speech generating device users, interviewing young people with physical disabilities who have or can use the speech generating devices in the context of their classrooms and in social activities, and being with these same young people on a day-to-day -day basis. While prior to engaging in this research, I had been with young people who use AAC countless times at various points in my career, but it was always for a different purpose. I had never been with them to watch, to learn, to understand. In the past, I was always there to help to intervene, to implement. During this study, I just watched and listened and listened and watched. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> Phenomenology as a method investigates the lived experience of those who experience a certain phenomenon. It's primarily a method for and of questioning rather than a method for answering or discovering 
um, <clears throat> drawing de determinant conclusions. Sorry, my voice is a little scratchy. It is early in the morning. <laughs> I, will try and, I will try and do better. <laughs> Phenomenology, as I said, is the study of the life world, the world as it is immediately experienced. In order to accomplish this, one must seek concrete lived experiences, experiences as lived through. While this may seem a simple task, it is often not. In my study, for example, when I asked the young people to tell me about a time they spoke with a speech generating device, they would often say, it was great. It helped me to speak to others. It helped me to communicate. While those reflections are very likely true, they are reflections upon the experience, not the actual description of the experience itself. <clears throat> the phenomenological inquiry involves story, gathering stories of lived experience and then reflecting on them to seek insights into the meaning of the phenomenon. One common approach, and the approach that I'm going to use today, this morning, this, evening, this afternoon, whatever time frame you're in, um, is <clears throat> sorry, to employ what is referred to as the existentials as a heuristic for employing or exploring the phenomenon. What I would like to do now is provide a glimpse into what it may be like to speak with, or as I said, is it through a device based on the stories of lived experience I have derived from both the published literature and speaking with participants in my study. Our voice, whether intelligible or not so intelligible, is something that is part of our lived body. Our voice emanates from our body. For most people who speak with their natural voices, one's voice is as unique as our fingerprints and as personal. And for most of us, our voice is not ours to choose. It's just what is given, our voice. That is, unless we must speak with the voice of the machine. Father, the first thing I did was to listen to the voice as I saw the one named Jill. I like that name, but it was so old. My voice, it sounds like an old grandma. Okay, so I thought maybe I would try Samantha. She sounds like a baby. I am not a baby. Then I saw a voice that didn't have a name. It was called 13 Cool Girl. I listened to that voice. That was it. That's my voice. A cool kid voice, just like mom always says, I am one cool kid. As a result of the amazing developments in speech synthesis technologies, today's devices sound wondrously human. Many even provide attention to the message carried by the human voice itself. Our voice says so much about us. It tells our sex, our age, our history. How interesting then is Gabby's task to search through the voices available to her on her new device until she finds her voice a girl's voice first. The voice must establish her as female, as certainly that is important for a young adolescent girl. And it must not sound too old or too young. Like Goldilocks in search of the comfort in the home of the three bears, Gabby tries on these synthetic voices. Not too old, not too young, just right. But one must wonder how could it be just right? And what may still be missing about Gabby in this voice of the machine? And yet my voice is not my own. I was watching the YouTube video where Kelly Fleishman was interviewing Channing Tatum. She uses the same voice as me. So when I closed my eyes, I could just imagine that it was me that was interviewing him. It was so cool. Hearing one's own voice coming from someone else's mouth. How strange that might be, unless perhaps you're an actor doing voiceovers. But even then, one must wonder if it would be at least a little disquieting to hear your voice as the voice of another. Yet for Liz, this does not seem strange. Indeed, it seems rather ordinary, and in this instance, fun. She can listen to herself interviewing one of today's most recognizable, and she would probably say hot, young actors. All she has to do is close her eyes and listen. While the voices offered up for use by a speech generating device may indeed be varied, they are also finite. It is not uncommon for two people, like Liz and Carly, who use speech generating devices, to use the same voice. Indeed, many of the young female speech generating device users that I have encountered speak with the same voice, literally the same voice. They tell me it is because people can understand this voice the best. The voice is one of high quality, yet it is a voice with no special features, no accent, no age specification, and no particular personality. Perhaps one might think of it as a high quality, neutral voice. 
How ironic then this may seem, despite all the choice of voice, the selection may not end up being one, <clears throat> being a voice that fits the user. Instead, the decision may be dictated by what the speech impaired person is seeking from the device in the first place, the desire to be well understood. When people call my device my voice, if my device is not with me, I still want people to communicate with and value me. Having a voice is really so much more than the audible voice that is provided by the speech generating device. To have a voice may well, <clears throat> may well be to be able to express oneself in whatever modality or mode one chooses or perhaps is presently available. As the philosopher Paul Watzelwick, I don't think I'm saying that correctly, puts forth as an axiom, one cannot not communicate, meaning that humans communicate as soon as they perceive each other. That perception may be colored by one's ability or not to speak naturally, but with or without an audible voice, one might still wish to be seen and valued as a person with the right to self-expression and to agency. I'm sorry. A speech generating device, it seems, may open up an audible space that without it may always be out of reach. Let us listen to Jessie as she recounts her story across the room with her voice. Use my thoughts as plug kids in my class, especially kids like Mike. We were in science class together. He was sitting right in front of me. I was thinking more on the moron, so I typed it into my device more, and it was quiet in class, so all the kids heard. And everybody started laughing. I could tell by his face he knew I was talking to him. He got all mad and called me a nerd. I called him moron for the rest of the year. Jesse's account is ordinary in so many ways. Who as a child has not called someone a name? especially someone who you want to pay attention to you. Jessie's no different. She has found a way to tease her friend, Mike, that is both clever. Boron is an element, you know, she told me with a grin when she recounted her story of bugging Mike in science class and effective. She got a reaction from Mike and she and everyone else knows it because Jessie got Mike to respond in kind, nerd, success. By reaching out across the audible space afforded to Jessie by using her speech generating device, Jessie has joined into the foray. She can tease and be teased back. She has become perhaps one of the gang. With the power of her voice, Jessie has made an auditory bond with her classmates. Would this bond have been possible without the voice of the machine? And yet, just as the device provides access to an opening of the audible space, so it may also close one in. It is really hard when I am in a noisy room or in a big gathering. Even when I have the volume all the way up on my device, it is never really loud enough to talk to people. One time in particular, I was at a wedding and ran into some old friends from school. They were excited to see me and wanted to chat. So did I, but we both quickly realized that my voice would not carry far enough to let them hear me. They needed to gather around so they could read what I was saying. And for a while they stayed with me. I excluded them my screen as they answered their questions about what I had been doing the past few years, and even answering some of the questions that I posed in our now text and talk based interaction. But soon the voices of the others gathered around the table drew them away from my screen and into their conversations. Conversations that I could not enter into as my voice would not carry me into that space. The natural voice of our body can modulate itself to be heard across far spaces and near spaces, in loud spaces and in quiet spaces. Not so the voice of the machine. In auditoriums, restaurants, and even halls where communities gather to celebrate, the voices produced by the speech generating device may fail to provide what they promise, connection. Instead, the device may demand that the audible space become the visual space the space where only the eyes can see as the screen, not the speaker, becomes the focal point of the interactions. <clears throat> but while, while this visual space may afford conversations across dyads or even perhaps triads of people, the audible space only becomes available to those who can be heard to engage in the lively conversations across the table or indeed perhaps across the room. And for 
Talking to people with an assistive device is not easy. The rate at which people comfortably hear and vocalize words is about 150 to 160 words per minute. Even using today's methods of user interface optimization and rate enhancement, communication rates <clears throat> achieved by a device user are often less than 10 words per minute. Even a person with very dexterous hands can only type at approximately one third of the normal speaking rate, with disability often reducing the speaking rate to excruciatingly slow speeds. It is interesting to note that many people <clears throat> know of speech generating devices, or at least many people in North America, through their encounters with Dr. Stephen Hawking, the eminent physicist. During his life, Dr. Hawking had used speech generating devices for decades. During that time, he'd made several public appearances. A fairly recent example was his cameo appearance on the, again, perhaps in North America particularly, popular television show, The Big Bang Theory. In this spot, Sheldon, one of the main characters in the show and a devout Stephen Hawking's groupie, gets the opportunity to meet the physicist and discuss his own dissertation with him. The conversation, while not quite normal, in that before each utterance Dr. Hawking makes with his device, there's a beep, beep, which tells us that he's doing something with it, and his computerized voice is without the richness of inflection and tone of a natural voice, but it is otherwise unremarkable. Sheldon and Dr. Hawking converse back and forth in much the same way that any budding scholar and distinguished researcher might, with bits of humor thrown in, as it is a situation comedy. Having seen this familiar conversational flow enabled by Dr. Hawking's use of a speech generating device, it is perhaps no wonder that many people, particularly parents, believe aided communicators will be able to converse in much the same way. What those watching the Big Bang Theory or listening to Dr. Hawking give lectures with the device are not privy to is the reality of what a, such a conversation would entail. These productions are scripted, edited. What it is really like is so much different. Consider Rebecca's experience at school with her device. I was in grade seven when I got my device, I was so excited, but as I got to school and tried to talk to my friends, I just couldn't get the words out fast enough. I am not a slow thinker, but even with my new device, I am a slow talker. At first, my friends waited to hear to what I had to say, but after a couple of sentences, they lost interest and had moved on to something else. I was always behind or always making them just wait for me. Most of the time when I got out what I wanted to say, it really didn't even make sense anymore because they were three topics ahead of me. So after a few times of that, I just pretty much just stopped talking. Talking with a device may put you on the banks of a fast flowing river or watching as the stream of conversation flows by. It also may make the people moving effortlessly through the flow of conversation uncomfortable or anxious as they recognize that you are not one of them. The irony of this experience may seem remarkable. The very thing that the machine provides, the connection through voice, it also seems to deny the free flowing ease of human vocal interaction. Mirla Ponti tells us that one can only be silent when one has the option of speech. While Becky seems to have gained the ability to choose to no longer remain silent, the pace of the conversation outruns anything that she can hope to achieve. The conversation, it is, seems, runs away on her, relegating her to becoming functionally voiceless once more. What the device demands. Human technology relations are at play in every aspect of speaking through a device. Indeed, it appears that in order to provide the affordance of speech, the device itself makes demands. I'm chatting with Gabby when the alarms go off on her device. My voice is running out of gas. There is a gas meter. The doo doo doo, you can't shut it off. I am trying to talk, but my body's passing out on me. It's a race between me and my battery. Now, we may have all had the experience of running out of energy to talk. We're just too tired to talk. Or perhaps we've been talking so much or so loud that our voice is sore. Worn out, we might say. But really, we are saying that. Uh, we are running out of gas, not our voice. <clears throat> Imagine being Gabby in the middle of a conversation. Her voice is going to die and it announces it to the world in the most annoying way. The device sounds the alarm. Do, 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 do. How strange this might seem to her conversation partner and how disruptive. I'm running out of gas. You must plug me in soon or I will no longer speak for you. 
shouts the machine. In response, Gabby enters into a race with the machine, a race that sends her body and very likely her mind into spasm. The spasm in turn takes precious energy, time that Gabby does not have if she's going to say what she wanted to say before the announcement that her device time to talk is running out. The speech generating devices of today often have long lasting batteries, batteries that are meant to last through a day's worth of conversation. Yet for a myriad of reasons, they may not. Perhaps one has forgot to plug it in last night. Perhaps it is a day where Gabby has been particularly chatty. Or perhaps it is a day that she's been texting all day long with her friends. Whatever reason, the, device, the machine demands to be plugged in to find somewhere to get energy. This may be fine if Gabby is in the classroom or at home, but imagine if she is not. Imagine if she's taking the bus across town to meet with someone and her device screams, I am about to die. What might it be that? to be thus rendered silent by the demanding device. And while speech generating devices bypass some of the physical demands of producing audible speech, they impose others. Accessing the message one wants to speak with the body that is unruly and perhaps inconsistent in its ability can prove demanding indeed. And this feat may require other technologies to be gauged in the request to, uh, to the device to speak. <clears throat> The time I hate most is at night when I'm out of my chair. When I'm out of my chair, I can't use my device, which means I can't talk, and it means I can't even text my friends. I know my friends are all texting each other and making plans. I can keep up with the chat when I have my device, but not when I'm out of my chair. As human beings, we talk. We talk in bed. We talk laying in the lounge chair beside the pool. We talk as we walk. But for Gabby, the ability to talk is only granted when she is in her chair with her switches by her head and her device placed in front of her. Her device demands that she use switches, her switches demand that be, she be in her chair. As her friends are madly texting under the covers about what will happen tomorrow and the gossip of today, Gabby is left out, not by her friends, but by the demands of the machine. And yet, we may understand that even as difficult and arduous a task of speaking through a device may sometimes seem, the power of audible voice can still have a decidedly positive impact on the life of a young child who cannot speak. Gym class was the first time that I really understood the power of having a voice. I remember my teachers had programmed some things for me to say into my devices before. Things like saying good morning, things like answering answers to a math question, and things like a line from a page in a story. But somehow those things never really seemed to matter. But that day in gym class was different. That day, the teacher put two words into my talker, only two words, stop and go. Then she told the class that we were going to play a running game and that I was in charge. I was in charge. How would that work? And then she said, OK, Katie, tell us what to do. I remember being a little confused, but then just pushing one of the buttons. Go. And all the kids started to run. I kind of went into a spasm and hit the same button again. Go, I said, and they went faster. Ha, huh, okay, now I get it. I pushed the other button, stop. It was noisy with all the kids running, so they didn't hear me. I looked up at my teacher. She turned the volume all the way up on my talker, stop. This time they heard me and the kids all screeched to halt. Some of, the, some of them even yelling, screech. Then they looked at me, I giggled, go. This time Miss Jackson pushed my wheelchair so I could go too. Go, 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 I said, and we all ran faster, stop. And we all stopped bumping into each other and laughing as we did. Stop, stop, go, I kept yelling with my talker. I was laughing so hard that tears were streaming down my face. Finally, Miss Jackson said, Katie, I'm pooped, and she blew the whistle. We all stopped for good. Jordan, who had never paid any attention to me before, ran up to me and said, Katie, can you tell me us what to do at gym all the time? That was fun. Lingus reminds us of the extraordinary power of voice to put us into contact. This was surely true for Katie. With those two small words, she made contact, created connection. She was heard and she was seen. Her teacher, by giving her two small words that mattered to her and to her classmates, may have forever changed the children's perception of Katie, and it seems perhaps her perception of herself. Sociolinguists tell us that small talk is never small. A few well-chosen words can connect us together. It is small talk that builds relationship. Yet for children who must use speech-generating devices, small talk is anything but small. 
As I carry on with my work in the field of AAC, I now hear that my task reaches far beyond helping children to use technology. It is <clears throat> to help that technology-mediated child to enter into the world of children and ultimately an interconnected world of human beings. And beyond this, to help the people that are tasked with helping the child become, to understand, understand what it is really like, helping us all to act to provide the space, time, and ethical actions that allow autonomous and authentic voices to be heard. And so I will leave as I began, listening to the voice of people who use speech generating devices to make their voices heard. We have much to learn about assistive technology, about its power, about its potential, and perhaps most of all, about its dreams deferred, about how much work you and I still have to do to close the gap between its promise and everyday reality. As I listen, I hear that call, the call to make contact, the, to close that gap between the promise and the practice. I hear the call to help students conquer the demands of the device to actively, meaningfully, and timely engage in the conversations of both the classroom and ultimately the world, I hear the call to listen. It is then when it is all said, but surely not done, that the message of children and adults who speak with machines, that the real transformational power of technology comes when the human beings, not the technology, can be heard. I hope you may be called to listen too. Thank you so much for your attention and again for inviting me to this wonderful conference. I know I went over, I apologize for that. Um, I tried to think how else I could cut out, but um, anyway, so thank you so much.